We're here talking with Gary Daly, who has a long history um, working in different sectors of Irish law, but especially in human rights law, and um, dealing with issues surrounding advocacy for Palestine and for Gaza. Recently, you um, helped found Irish Lawyers for Palestine, so can you please tell us a little bit about both your professional history and what drew you to this cause? Um, so. Uh, I'm qualified over 20 years, a long time, I'm very old, but um, for a long time uh, in my family, I guess, we would have always been interested in um, resistance against imperialism, colonialism, from the background of my, my family from the north of Ireland, uh, and the comparisons between the two struggles, I guess. Um, so I always had an interest in that anyway, and then you know, using my qual, I've, you know, you you try to figure out how you can be most helpful to any campaign or struggle or cause, and me as a qualified lawyer, I suppose, um, I'm best helpful. There's no point in me trying to be a doctor with no qualifications, so I try and be a, you know, represent people or advocate or disseminate legal information, which is why we start we started up Irish Lawyers for Palestine. It's on uh, Instagram and we're sharing, well I am sharing, um, regular updates about, for example, the ICJ case uh, and other legal issues that pertain to the current genocide in Gaza. So if people want to find that, they can just search on Instagram, Irish Lawyers for Palestine? Absolutely. Okay. On, it's on Instagram. We started a Twitter page, and I'm very bad at starting these things, so a young Palestinian woman who's working with me in the office here, she's amazing. She has helped me start those things because I am incapable. What are some of the goals that you had with starting this? Oh, uh, um, well, for me, uh, education uh, and advocacy um, will be the two big things because there's so much misinformation put out on social media. Um, and I think everybody here knows what I'm talking about. Um, so in order to counteract that, I'm trying to give a really accurate not a you know not intemperate not not overreactionary just no this is the law this is what's happened and if you apply the law to this set of facts well this should be the result so again for example with the ICJ case um, there is a framework under the genocide act and the and the ICJ legislation and the um, court made its provisional measures findings and they were good findings for example mm -hmm. so we talked a bit about that on the and I shared a lot of information on it from other really brilliant lawyers like Noura Erekat. Um, she's a Palestinian American lawyer. We, we share a lot of her stuff. She's a friend of mine and she's amazing. But other other lawyers internationally as well. And obviously the most important thing is to give a platform to Palestinian voices, not just Palestinian lawyers, but Palestinian activists and Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so then going off of that, can you tell us a little bit of background about what is the ICJ, how does it operate, kind of generally speaking? So the ICJ is the International Court of Justice, or otherwise known as the World Court, um, and it is a court that was founded as part of the UN, effectively. It's, you know, there's, a, there's a longer history than that, but that's the short version, um, and it one of its roles is to examine cases taken before it under the Genocide Convention. All the members of the UN are bound by the findings of of the uh, ICJ, so 150 countries approximately. Um, there are four countries that have derogated from those findings, two of them being America and Israel, um, but uh, nevertheless the findings are binding. Um, so again, to refer back to the, the decision that was rendered quite recently by the ICJ, it was a strong decision um, and it will be interesting to see how that goes now. Can you tell us a bit about the case that South Africa recently brought? What were the main arguments that they were making and what kind of evidence would they be using in such a case? Oh yeah, um, well it, it was a really fantastically put together case. Um, and one of the lawyers involved in it is an Irish woman, you're probably aware of that, Belinda Negralig, who uh, I got to know recently, We uh, kind of the embryonic stage of Irish lawyers for Palestine we circulated a letter uh, and it was signed by 200 Irish lawyers uh, calling on the Irish government to intervene in this genocide. Um, and Blina was central in helping draft that letter, a small group of us 
including two professors of law based in Ireland as well. Um, and uh, the ICJ case um, was taken against Israel, but they brought Israel to the World Court, to the ICJ, uh, and accused them of genocide, committing genocide in Gaza. And they introduced evidence, uh, a lot of which the people here would have seen a lot of. Um, so the demolition of houses, the demolition of universities, the demolition of places of religious worship like mosques and churches, uh, obviously the slaughter of human beings, particularly children and, and pregnant women, um, you know, really, really gruesome stuff. They, they didn't show too many videos. They made a decision not to. They relied on uh, relaying verbally the, the information to the court. Um, um, but they also then analysed the Genocide Act and explained to the court, or, or argued before the court rather, that um, Israel was falling foul of the, the particular terms of the Genocide Act, which I have here. Mm. Anyway, we can talk about that and yeah, all. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious, this is, diverges a bit, but mm -hmm. actually one question I had, and I think a lot of people had, is why they chose not to show the videos that, you know, we've all been seeing so many videos on social media of the horrific things that are happening in Gaza and you know what why do you think that they would have chosen to stick to more like um, oral testimony like verbal testimony I, I think if I remember correctly Blin and Egralik actually explained the reason why and it just doesn't come to mind now but I, I think they wanted to make it a very legalistic application mm. that it wasn't going to be you know this is terrible look at how awful this we, we want each of the judges to cry they wanted to prove the case from a legal perspective. They wanted to prove the case based strictly on the evidence, not on the visual impact of photographs and videos. And I think it was all the stronger for that. It would have, I'm sure for, for Palestinian people, particularly watching it, it would have been, <clears throat> it would have been you know, very impactful for them to watch their, their people getting slaughtered and that those videos being played in the world court but from a legal perspective I, th I thought it was very effective actually yeah particularly again i know she's somebody that i know very very briefly but i thought blin and negrolic's um, presentation of those facts was incredibly effective a number of us saw you speak last week at um the march for gaza in dublin um and one of the things that you had mentioned, you had talked a lot about um, the provisional measures that the ICJ had ruled and some um, misunderstandings some people may have had about those. Um, and, and you had a very hopeful tone, I do remember that. And, and so I was wondering if you could you know, um, talk more about that, both what the ICJ ruled and what does that mean and how does that compare to um, other cases in the past? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of people afterwards came up to me to ask me about the speech and why, well, not why in, in an accusatory sense, but more asking me to explain in, in more detail because you only get so long in a speech to explain these things. Um, but why I was positive about the case and why the findings that were made by the court on the provisional measures were something to be positive about as Palestinians and as, as people who feel solidarity with them. Um, and I think the main thing, that really what you're asking me is the, the World Court did not order a ceasefire. Yeah. Um, now, that's not the first time that that has happened. They didn't order a ceasefire in the Myanmar case. They didn't order a ceasefire in the Bosnia-Serbia case. They don't always order a ceasefire, even if they say there is evidence that can point towards genocide and will go forward to a full hearing, like those other cases did. Uh, they did order a ceasefire in Ukraine, but it was a very different set of facts. And I've spoken to the to um, professors of international law about this specific point, and um, they would know better than me, to be honest with you, because they study this case law, they teach it, um, and they were very very happy with with the provisional measures that were that were uh, ordered by the court. So the first provisional measure that was ordered. Uh, the State of Israel shall, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention and Prevention of the Crime of Genocide in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of this Convention, in particular killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group, 
deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part and imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Now, the first thing to observe with that, the first provisional measure or six provisional measures that they ordered, there are five headings under the, uh, into the, in the Genocide Convention under Article 2. The only one that they didn't make, uh, that they didn't refer to in that is the fifth heading under the Genocide Convention, which is forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, that doesn't mean forcibly transferring them because there is huge evidence of ethnic cleansing of, of Palestinians being forced from their homes in northern Gaza, central Gaza, down to Rafa, Khan Yunus. Um, so it's transferring the children of the group to another group. Now, I, I, I did read the South African submission. I can't remember. I should go back and check and see if they made a, <coughs> an application under that specific heading. I don't recall it, to be honest with you. But to make a finding and refer to those four headings of the five, I think is really uh, comprehensive. Um, and uh, so that's one point on it. And then the, the main part of it is take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2. So they must take all measures to prevent these acts. Well, number one is killing members of the group. So they have to stop killing people. How else do you do that by, otherwise than by a, a ceasefire? Yeah. You know? So in, in my view, and this is, it's not just my view, and a, a lot of people who are, have a lot of expertise in international humanitarian law, which is this area of law, they're, you know, the, the, the consensus, the, the broad consensus is, how else can you achieve to en enforce, particularly the first provisional measure that was ordered, without a ceasefire? Now, the other provisional measures... Uh, with immediate effect that its military does not commit any acts described in point one. So um, that the state of Israel doesn't, it takes all measures to prevent these things. And then it specifically talks about its military, the IDF or the IOF. Um, and the third one then, to prevent and punish public incitement. Now we've all seen the, the statements made by I'm not, I'm not going to go through them, um, but we, we, we know what we're talking about here. The incitements to genocide, the public officials, and I thought um, it was incredibly impactful to hear those statements being read out. The Prime Minister of Israel, the President of Israel, the Head of the Defence Forces, the, you know, the various different uh, gallant and these people, the, the quotes that they read out. To hear that being read out in the World Court for a Palestinian like for me, I was emotional listening to it. I can't even begin to imagine what it was like for Palestinians to have this read out in an accusatory with Israel sitting in the dock on the receiving end of this. It must be it must have been just incredibly powerful for them. And any Palestinians I've spoken to would say that. But the provisional measure is that they prevent and punish the direct and public incitement to commit genocide by members uh, in relation to members of the Palestinian group. The fourth one is again in my view, how is it achieved without a ceasefire to enable the provision, to, so the State of Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. How do you get basic services and humanitarian assistance in without a ceasefire? You can't, you know, these services can't go in without the bombs stopping and the bullets stopping, in, in my view. And again, this is, you know, a lot of people um, say the same thing. Uh, the fifth one, the State of Israel shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Articles 2 and 3. Now, that's in relation to the full hearing, which won't be for probably a few years. Um, but evidence is, you know, what do they do to those universities, to the schools, to the houses, the homes, all that kind of stuff. They're literally, they're bulldozing stuff. They're getting rid, they're even digging up bodies. You know, so um, they're being told you can't keep doing that because that is, you're destroying the evidence that will be required by South Africa to prove their case at a later date. They presented some evidence, but this is going to go on, unfortunately for the Palestinian people involved, probably another while, difficult to know yet, but that evidence is required for the full hearing. So again, I think that's 
indicative of the requirement for a ceasefire. And the, the last one is the State of Israel shall submit a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one month. Now, for example, in I think it was the Myanmar case, they were ordered to come back, the uh, Myanmar government were ordered to come back in four months. Mm -hmm. So again, one month is actually, even though I saw a lot of people really criticising, you know, they can keep doing what they want for a month and then they have to come back and do a report and the report will be ignored, probably. But the court is doing everything. It, in my view, it's, it's given a strong decision there that, uh, and, and an indication, for example, like the one month versus four months, that the, this is a really, really serious and urgent situation. Now, that, that's the analysis of the provisional measures. Definitely. So in that case then, if they were to come back in a month, mm -hmm. and um, as far as I understand, at that time, in a month's time, South Africa will also have a chance to respond to the evidence that Israel will present in, uh, to the court in one month's time. So uh, if there is evidence that South Africa presents that um, they have not followed the court's rulings, mm -hmm. um, what will happen then? And also, here we can talk about, you know, since the ICJ ruling, we've seen a number of ways that they have not been following these rulings. So I'm thinking of the um, Return to Gaza conference, where there's video on video, you have top senior Israeli government officials um, celebrating the potential for eradicating all. Palestinians from Gaza and building new Israeli settlements on top of it. You know, will the court take these things into consideration and what will happen as a result? Excellent question. Um, the answer, unfortunately, is it's the UN. So the, the sanction enabled by the court, the, the structure of the court on the UN, you know this as well as I do, unfortunately, if uh, the court says, yes, there are breaches here and we order, for example, you must stop immediately and they, they make more stringent protective measures and I, I doubt they'll order a ceasefire. I, I forgot to say by the way there's another argument in relation to not ordering a ceasefire because are they an occupying power or not? Uh, so they may have had to make a ruling on whether Israel is an occupying power of Gaza. They are an occupying power of the West Bank. We, us here, I would assume would argue that they're also an occupying power of Gaza but they've always said sure we pulled out in 2005 so we don't occupy Gaza, even though they've had a, a complete siege and blockade of Gaza. Um, so that is, in effect, they are an occupying power. But sorry, so I don't mean to interrupt you, but so what you're getting at is whether they are considered an occupying power or not would impact whether it would be considered a ceasefire. Exactly. Or not. So Russia were ordered to ceasefire. The order for ceasefire was there because Russia had invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they were ordered to ceasefire. And effectively, to 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 no, the implication was to withdraw, withdraw their forces. If you're telling Israel to withdraw from Gaza and by extension, then you would say, well, if they're an occupying their power there, they're certainly an occupying power in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. So they should have. They, look, it it really would have caused a lot of consternation, and I think the court probably, you know, ran away from that decision, yeah. but. It, this, sorry, the specific question you're asking me is the enforcement of any uh, protective measures ordered now or in a month's time. Uh, it, it all comes down to the Security Council of the UN. If the Security Council of the UN uh, are asked by the World Court to say, right, you must go in here now and stop this, you know that the Americans will exercise their veto and nothing will be done, unfortunately. And that, that's already been talked about anyway. Right. But at the very least, the court would have the power to say, to rule, you have not followed what we have called for. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I wanted to just uh, touch on something that you had just mentioned. So from my understanding, a lot of the ways that this is different, this case is, is very complicated because there is, you're not dealing with two sovereign nations, sure. right? And like, how does that affect what we're seeing here? You because mean it's Palestine not like is on a exactly. Yeah. It's not like Russia and Ukraine because in Russia and Ukraine you have two separate sovereign nations, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the case, legally speaking, with Palestine. Yeah. Well, um, again, that was I think part of the argument made by Israel that because Palestine have not accepted Israel's borders and they've refused to accept 
Israel as a state, therefore they're not a sovereign state and therefore they're not even bound by the, the rules of, of the ICJ. The ICJ rejected that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from that perspective they, they found that they were a protected group, they found that uh, they were entitled to the protections of the Genocide Convention, they found that there was an existing dispute between the parties, between South Africa and Israel. Uh, they, all the findings that they made up to the provisional measures were very, you know, were very solid, went with South Africa all the way along, right. which is really important. I've heard, and I don't know if you would know anything about this, but I've heard some people make the argument basically that because uh, Israel is an occupying power in Gaza, because they have this complete siege on, on and control of all of its borders, that they don't have the right legally to claim self-defense. Do you understand what I'm getting at? I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And the ICJ have already given a limited decision on this in their uh, 2004 advisory opinion on the wall that goes around the West Bank. Now it's not in relation to Gaza, it's specifically around about you know, the separation barrier as they call it around the West Bank, but they specifically address it and they say because they're an occupying power under the Geneva Convention they then cannot, how can you claim self-defense if you're the aggressor? And they, they now it's a short, unfortunately they didn't flesh it out too much, it's only I think a paragraph or two in that 2004 decision, but it's a good, it's an advisory opinion. Right. So a lot of this hinges on, then, when we're looking at Gaza, whether they're going to be considered, or whether they would be considered, legally speaking, an occupying power or not, when you have Israel saying on one hand that they have withdrawn, and on the other hand they still are maintaining this complete kind of control of all of its borders and, and airspace and water space. I, d I don't think that's... It may come in in the full hearing, but it certainly hasn't. It wasn't mentioned at all, really, in, in the, in the uh, provisional measures application. South Africa and I think both sides will probably want to stay away from that and the court will be happy to stay away from that because it's such a vexed issue. There has been so much legal argument about that specific point. Are Israel, like they, as you said, they claim self-defense all the time and yet you go through the West Bank, which I'm sure we all have here, what do you see with checkpoints all the way through the West Bank? How can you be defending yourself if your checkpoints are in somebody else's country? There is still, even after the provisional ICJ ruling, you still have um, the United States government saying that they fully support um, Israel's actions and the Israeli military. And if the U.S. were to continue sending uh, arms or sending military aid money or something, anything like this, to Israel, at this stage, is there any way that they could be held complicit um, from a legal perspective in aiding this, given that they have the information, they have the evidence, seeing what is happening on the ground and they're still continuing to facilitate it by weapons and, and funding. So there was a, a decision in California, California State Court right. this week. Uh, a case was taken by al Haq, which were an amazing or, uh, legal organization operating in the West Bank, and a group of American Palestinian activist lawyers and they took a case against Joe Biden, against Anthony Blinken, and Lloyd, I can't remember his surname, um, the Secretary <laughs> of Defense. Yeah. Um, they took a case personally against those three for complicity in genocide, mm -hmm. and accused them of genocide, specifically genocide. And uh, the, the nexus of the case, the, the link between the genocide happening in Gaza and America is obviously they are arming and they're, they're providing funding. They're the ones enabling this genocide. Well, other countries as well. Uh, the court, unfortunately, um, struck the case out. Mm -hmm. No, what day is today? Today's Friday. I think it was Wednesday of this yeah. week. Yeah. So it's very recent. Yeah. Um, and um, from what I understand about the specifics of the case, they never really thought they were going to win because effectively you're asking the judiciary to make a decision which will interfere with the executive with the, with the role and the power of the executive. Now, uh, a very good friend of mine, lawyer, um, uh, sent me a case today actually, which I haven't had time to read, where there was a similar case in America where they did interfere in the exercise of executive functions. But I think the, um, the feeling always was, even though they took that case and they were right to take that case, that whatever chance there was of the court interfering in another situation, we're never going to interfere when it came to America supporting Israel.
Right. But from what I read, they did, like, the judge in this case did very similar, it sounded very similar to what the ICJ ruled, that there is plausible evidence there, 100%. but they didn't have the jurisdiction that, to So that's my point. They're it. saying they didn't have the jurisdiction to interfere right. with the executive power, right. but did quote that the ICJ had found plausible evidence that genocide is being committed. Right. And for that, again, to be spoken openly in a court in America, the biggest funder and, and supporter of Israeli genocide, you know, is, is a big thing in and of itself. Lawyers are celebrating that, but ultimately the, the case is struck out. There's another case in Britain against the British government, uh, and you might have seen um, David Cameron being interviewed about it. Um, so the British government have to issue licenses for arms sales and they you know as they're selling weapons to Israel they're being asked to issue licenses and there's a clause in the statute in relation to the issuing of the license that they have to ensure that the end use of the weapons is not in breach of human rights international human rights or the human rights of those people that they're being used against and the British government had internal reports which said we have serious concerns about this but nevertheless they, they issued the licenses that case is ongoing. That's been taken by Golan, which is the Global Legal Action Network. They're fantastic. Uh, I think Al Hack are involved in that as well, although I'm not sure. I know you have mentioned, and, and I've seen in a lot of places, that the final ruling could take years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering why does it take so long? Um, and what are some of the possible outcomes that we might expect to come of it? Uh, well, firstly, um, there are a number of stages to the case um, and one of those stages is where other countries intervene in the case and we have been calling on the Irish government to at least issue a declaration. Sinn Féin brought a motion on Wednesday evening uh, and we were outside the Doyle uh, protesting again and they ignored that motion and they refused. So they brought a counter motion and we were protesting last week about it as well. Uh, their counter motion was that they would consider intervening in the case. Um, I think what's important to be aware of is that, for example, Germany, so there's a lot of racism, open racism being discussed now at the moment. It, it really is remarkable. Some of the interviews I'm sure you've seen on TV are just the, the, the naked anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian racism. It's just phenomenal. So, sorry, my point is, it's not an Arab country that... Uh, came out two hours after Israel finished their presentation at the ICJ. Germany, which is you know blonde, white, uh, blue-eyed, you know, good capitalists, they issued a very strong statement to say that they were going to intervene in the case on the side of Israel. Two hours after they finished, Ireland are saying, "Oh, we have to wait and see," which I think is extraordinary, particularly considering how supportive Ireland is for Palestine. Um, so. Some states have already, I think about 10 states have said that they are going to intervene. So those interventions will take time to be processed and lodged and then there will be a declaration of response uh, from Israel to each of those interventions. So there's, there's, there's a number of stages to go through. Unfortunately, like every case, cases we're involved in here in the office, they, they take some time. Yeah. What are some of the possible outcomes that could come from this? Well, the outcome that we expect is that Israel has committed genocide. In, in Gaza, right. you know, and if they make that finding, you know, how does Israel come back from that? Now, they will, of course, say that the, the court is illegitimate, that the UN has always been after them, all that kind of stuff, but Israel claiming that they're the only democracy in the Middle East and they're the ones that are found to have committed uh, genocide, that will be, you know, how do they negotiate or how do they spin their way out of that one? Yeah. And particularly when you look at Again, and I go back to the provisional measures, I know you asked me about the end, but I think we, to understand the end, we look at the beginning. If you look at the, uh, the voting of each of the judges, uh, there's only one judge that voted against everything, that Ugandan judge, but even the Israeli judge didn't vote against everything. They, uh, the, the Israeli judge abstained. Like every, it was, you know, 15 to 2, I'm, I'm trying to see where the votes are, 16 votes to 1, 16 votes to 1. You know, so how does Israel defeat this case with the evidence that, and unfortunately, and it, it breaks everybody's heart here in this room, more bodies will have dropped. You know, more children will have been killed, more women will have been killed, more men will have been killed, 
uh, by the time we get to that hearing. You know. Okay. Uh, now, what if it goes to a full hearing? And I really hope it does. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if if America, under pressure from Israel, tries to change the structure of the World Court, or you know, they try to. Now, I think the UN should be changed anyway. How can the, all the colonial powers, you know, England, France, uh, America, Russia, these superpowers, they're colonialists. How can they have this veto? And small countries like Ireland, like Palestine, you know, we're completely at the whim of this Security Council veto. The UN is absolutely useless unless the colonial powers decide that it, it will be used for something. Right. So What do you think are some I mean, and again, this is just completely hypothetical, but, you know, you talked a lot about this, about colonialism, imperialism, and the effects that it has on the UN, and I've seen a lot of people who have kind of just lost hope, right? They've completely given up that the UN is just a tool for imperialism and neo-imperialism, and, you know, given your understanding of these things, do you still have hope, and how do you keep that alive? How do you keep kind of pushing forward? understanding that background of, of imperialism and, and how it affects the functioning of the UN, the ICJ, the ICC, all of these things? I think it would be incredibly selfish of me to lose hope because the Palestinian people are the ones that need the likes of me and you and everybody else to continue with our solidarity work because they're in the middle of a genocide. They're in the middle of an occupation. And if I lose hope, I'm just tired of it and I give up and I walk away. I'm betraying them. They, they, you know, the Palestinian people need, and I'm only a tiny part, but we all are involved in some way or another in, in um, solidarity. And if, if the more people, and I think actually something, it's dreadful to say, but the only positive I can see out of this is that Israel's actions have been so extreme and the statements made by their leaders have been so extreme that the mask has completely... Now, again, everybody here in this room has known what they're like for a long time, but for the ordinary person who's not interested and who, you know, they'll watch Instagram and whatever else young people watch, um, they can't help but, oh my, oh my God, is that real? And so many more people are contacting me, and I'm sure you guys as well, saying, what? what's happening here? Like, this, is, this can't go on. So I think that uh, will benefit the Palestinian people ultimately. I think it, it's taking time, but I think the tide is turning. Um, and I think also what I talked about, the, the colonialism and the imperialism of the Security Council and the way it's structured to enforce their, you know, it's, it's a legacy of 100 years ago or 50 years ago, you know, post-World War I or post-World War post World War II, unless the colonial powers decide to do something, then nobody does it, no matter how many General Assembly's resolutions are passed. And I think, again, people are saying, hang on, we, this case was a really powerful case, went to the ICJ, and nothing has changed. Israel has continued to slaughter people. And Britain is not only arming them, but it, their Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, who's supposed to be a human rights lawyer, by the way, Keir Starmer, are refusing to even call for a ceasefire. Joe Biden, Genocide Joe, refusing to even call for a ceasefire. So I think, again, the mask has slipped. People, lots of people I know, are saying to me, I just never realized it was this bad. And it took the deaths of 28,000 Palestinians for people to start seeing, my God, is this the way the world really is? But if that's the, and it, it, again, I really don't want any Palestinian friends to think that I'm, I'm not, I'm broken hearted for all the death and destruction. But at least ultimately, if their deaths aren't in vain, that people start to say, no, this, this can't go on, and then governments change. Because, you know, power comes from the ground up, ultimately. And if people change what their governments do, then ultimately, hopefully in America and in Britain, like Ireland is very supportive, but we have to keep pressuring our, our governments, and hopefully global movements will like, I, I watched the documentary in the Vietnam War last night, you know, and again, your country was, was you know, um, was, like there was no questioning until things began to change. And one of my heroes, and I'm, it's another campaign I'm involved in, by the way, in a small way, the Irish Sport for Palestine, a lot of Irish sport people who I'd never really seen getting involved in this kind of stuff before. We had a letter that we presented to the Minister for Sport yesterday in relation to a basketball game 
happening against Israel next week. And that letter has been signed by nearly 400 famous Irish sports people. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that before. You know, sports stars that I never saw getting involved in making statements about human rights are all no, no, no this, this, this is, I've never seen anything like this. I must do something. Yeah, you it's know? it's interesting that you mentioned Vietnam because something that I uh, was told recently, or someone was uh, mentioning this to me, in, in after Vietnam, there was a huge shift in how the media portrayed war. So really, Vietnam until now. Vietnam was the last war that people sitting at home in these colonialist powers countries were seeing firsthand kind of what their governments were doing and what their militaries were doing. And then there was this kind of media blackout. And if you look at all the wars the Western colonialist powers have waged since, we didn't have those firsthand images. And now I think, you know, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but one of the reasons there is this huge global awakening is because people are seeing it for the first time. What does that actually look like? You know, what does that, what does the death and destruction actually look like in real time, in color, in, in video, mm. you know? Yeah, well, I think social media, um, like, I, I detest, what do you call the Twitter guy, Elon Musk, absolutely yeah. detest everything he stands for. But Twitter is good for the dissemination of information. Yeah. Facebook and Instagram, very good for the dissemin dissemination of in uh, information. I must say to you, um, I get the point that we're seeing the images now where we never saw them before, but um, I'm a lot older than you, but yeah. the, the biggest crime until this was the invasion of Iraq yes. by yeah. Britain and America. Yeah. I, I felt so incredibly strongly, and that destabilised the region as well. And a million yeah. Iraqi civilians yeah. died. Yeah, but I think, you know? at least from what I remember, and I was very young at the time, but there wasn't, at least in the US, nearly the same level of escalation of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. You're seeing now every single campaign event by Biden is being interrupted, mm -hmm. town halls being interrupted, um, just the complete, uh, all, you know, every person coming together and disrupting as much as possible in, in a very short amount of time. And mm -hmm. I think that definitely during the Iraq war, it is, I mean, the immensity of the destruction is, I can't even comprehend it, but people weren't as moved to such an escalation of action against the government in the U.S. as, as what we're seeing now. Let me wrap up, first of all, by thanking you for taking so much time Thank and, you and explaining this. Thank you and all of you. And in such detail, I really appreciate it. Um, and is there anything else that you think the average person at home who doesn't have that much legal information should know about what's going on right now, both from pressuring our own governments or understanding what we're seeing at the ICJ or anything else? Um, I suppose the fundamental for me is to question everything. Um, again, to go back to the Iraq war, the New York Times were cheerleaders of that invasion. you know, And it's just the most appalling thing. I just still, still can't get over it all these years later. Um, but I think people are beginning to question everything. Like Noam Chomsky is one of my heroes and that's that's one thing he would always say in his, his a book that changed my life, Manufacturing Consent. How do governments get away with this? It's not just through the newspapers, it's through the movies and the and television programs we watch where brown men are the bad guys. And we're, we're watching that from an early age, you know. And when I was young, it was people speaking with the Russian accents. They were the bad guys because we're in the Cold War. And in years to come, or probably a few years to come, it'll be all the bad guys in the in in uh, movies, in cartoons, in uh, TV programs. They'll be Chinese because that's the next geopolitical struggle that's going to happen. And it, it, it again, as I said, to Chomsky's analysis of the levels of how consent is is manufactured. It's not just. It's not just the, the broadsheet newspapers, it's not the New York Times, it's not just the Irish Times, or it's not just, even the Guardian has been terrible in Britain, you know, but it's, it's all strata of society. So if we, like, it really requires everybody to talk to each other. And that's, again, the benefit of social media is sharing this information. That's why I start, coming back to the start, yeah. that's why I started that Irish Lawyers for Palestine, to share information that I think is the correct information. You know, I want one other thing. It's a kind of a favorite little hobby horse of mine. 
um, I do jiu-jitsu and I train with guys who are less than half my age and they kill me in the gym. Um, uh, some of them train in the UFC and that kind of stuff, they're great guys, but um, they are exposed to Jordan Peterson, they're exposed to Andrew Tate, uh, and some of them are, you know, and I have conversations with those young guys in the main. Um, it is really important, I think, that people like yourself, like everybody here in this room, have conversations with the next generation. Not in a confrontational way, I always try and sit beside, you know, after training, sit beside them in the, in the dressing room and have a chat and say, women aren't like that. You know, women are human beings just like you. Does your mother, do you think about your mother you're talking about? So th that's a broader thing, I think, but it's really important that in the context of Palestine, people are always asking me, why are you so wound up? And I sit down and I talk to them. And that is a really important part of the solidarity movement. Yeah, definitely, I agree with that. Thank you so much.